verse 1 of Romans chapter 10, and then we'll go down to verse 8 and follow from there. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Verse 8, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. May God bless to us the reading of his sacred word. All during this week, you've been lifting up your eyes and looking onto the fields all over our world, Africa and South America, the Far East, to work amongst boys and girls. But one thing that must strike us is that the mission field is not out there across the seas. We are living on the mission field. It's all around us. It happened so for Amy Carmichael when she was only a girl of 17. Having been converted in Harrogate in Yorkshire, she returned to Belfast. And with her family, as they traveled from College Gardens to the Rosemary Street Presbyterian Church, she could see all around her people in need. And although Amy Carmichael would eventually go to Japan and then go to India, where for years she would rescue little girls from the temple, yet she saw that the mission field was on the Dublin Road in Belfast. Coming home from the Presbyterian Church, Seeing a lady in great need, she got out of her carriage and summoned her two brothers to come and help her as they helped the aged lady carry her burden on the Dublin Road. And there on that Dublin Road, there's the monument that's still there outside the, the BBC headquarters, the fountain where she dedicated her life to the Lord Jesus. And that step would take her all across our world. It was Amy Carmichael who wrote the words, Oh, for a passionate passion for souls. Oh, for a heart that burns. Oh, for a love that loves unto death. Oh, for a heart that yearns. Amy Carmichael shared exactly the same burden of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was undoubtedly not only the greatest missionary who was ever known, but the greatest Christian who was ever known. He was arrested and, thank God, apprehended, as we would say, on the road to, to Damascus when he called upon God for mercy. The Bible reminds us that he asked the Lord two questions on that day. Who art thou, Lord? What wilt thou have me to do? The Apostle Paul spent the rest of his life answering both of those questions. His letters are all about knowing Christ, who art thou, Lord? And he said that he wanted to know the Savior more and more. What an assignment for all of us. The other question was, what wilt thou have me to do? He realized that he was not only brought into the family of God, but being part of the family of God, why this field, this harvest field, he was now a servant of the Lord of hosts. And the Lord said of him, Thou art a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name unto the nations, to kings. And the Apostle Paul, although they say he was a little man, he was a little man with a big heart, a big heart of passion, of love for Christ, and love for souls. So much so that in the Roman Empire of that particular time, he planted the banner of the cross in every major Roman city and preached the gospel of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. He was a man who had great passion and vision. 
That vision, that passion is summed up here in this chapter from which we've been reading this evening. As a matter of fact, you can almost sense the passion and the pathos as he prayed and said, uh, Brethren, my, my heart's desire, that is my, my heart's passion, my heart's desire to God for Israel is that they might be saved. The passion of his heart was the salvation of his kinsmen according to the flesh. As a matter of fact, in chapter 9, he said, I could wish myself accursed for Christ for my kinsmen according to the flesh. He wanted to win the Jews for Jesus Christ. It was the passion of his praying. Not only so, it was the passion of his preaching. He said it in verse 8, what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. That is the word of truth which we preach. And what did he preach? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. He not only prayed that people would be saved, my friend, he was preaching to that end. That was the, the objective of preaching, that men and women, boys and girls, might be saved by the grace of God. And indeed, having prayed to that end and having indicated that that was the purpose and the aim of his preaching, why down here in verse 13 he shows this was his plea before men and women. We were singing about it this evening. Whosoever, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He saw that that was his mission in life. As a matter of fact, he goes on to say those words, How shall they call on him of whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? If you take those steps in reverse, it indicates that God sends the preachers, and the preachers preach that the people may hear, and the people hear that they might believe, and they believe that they might be called, and whosoever calls, on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Don't you see that from the heart of God in heaven to the heart of sinners here on earth, it is God's passion, God's will, that you might be saved. The Bible reminds us that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to a personal saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For many years, we have traveled on the Rivers of the Amazon, not only in the cities throughout Brazil, but in the rivers of the Amazon, preaching the gospel of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, trying to fulfill this objective of the Apostle Paul and indeed of the Great Commission to take the gospel into all the world and preach to every creature. For many years in the little town of Tarawaka, that was exactly the, the whole objective of entering into Tarawaka. I remember when we went into Tarawaka, while Dr. Geddes was there, he still hadn't learned Portuguese. So Audrey and I arrived in the month of August. And when we saw the opportunities in that town, we decided with Tom and Ethel to start children's meetings. We didn't have a church. We just went down to the side of the river. And, and uh, I remember going from house to house and calling the families and telling the boys and girls to come. Uh, there was a lot of hesitancy in that time. The Catholic Church on the loudspeaker, they had announced that these foreigners arrived. They were outcasts from their country, and you've got to be careful of them. But about 30, 40 boys and girls gathered around, sat around the grass as uh, we sang the choruses and we give them a children's story. But very soon before the end of that week, we had a week of meetings for the boys and girls. We had over 100 boys and girls, and then mums and dads, and people coming out of the houses and listening to the Word of God. My friend, that was the beginning of a movement where God was to move in that time. I had to leave Audrey there for three months while I went elsewhere to the Boca do Acre. And when I came back in the month of November, that was, I left at the end of August, came back in November. And when I came back, Tom had purchased a house. We, uh, we had knocked down a few walls in that house. I was never a carpenter, but I made some benches for the people to sit on. After I got the meal, I was praying they wouldn't collapse when the people did sit on them. But uh, I remember we opened the first meeting in that, in that uh, old uh, renovated house. We whitewashed it on the outside and put these forms in. And we stood at the door as we prayed that the people might come in. The, the Catholic Church gave the what they call the 
the sinal, the, the sino, the bells on a Sunday night, indicating the end of the mass. It was almost 7:30. Our meeting was going to start at 7.30 and they came from the Catholic Church just down the street and we stood in the street just directing them on into the renovated house. Uh, that night, we thank God that I think four precious souls trusted Christ. During that week, we had a week of gospel meetings. 16 people trusted Christ the Savior. That was only the trickle of what was to be a river of blessing in that town. A river of blessing, so much so that that old house was enlarged five times, and then we pulled it down to build a, a wooden church, and then we had to pull that church down to build a bigger church. Out there in Brazil, we have windows in our churches, but there's no glass in them because of the heat. So the Lord has blessed us with a good, loud voice, and that meant as we preached on the inside, the people across the road could hear us. And they got saved. Donna Edna got saved in the house across the road from us. Next door, her mother, Donna Ejimea, we had the joy of leading Ejimea to Christ. Next door was the telegraphist of the town, Sinners Wong, who was a drunkard, sat out in the tropical air every night, but listened to the gospel, and one day I had the joy of leading him to Christ. Next door, Sinner Milton and Donna Bibi, they trusted the Savior. Next door, Maria Espanol, a former prostitute. She trusted Christ. Across the road, Donna Elena trusted the Lord. Next door, Senior Hebrew Marmora. They trusted the Lord. All of the neighbors came to Christ. Week after week, why there were maybe 15, 20 people every Sunday night coming to Christ, those were times of revival and blessing. And how we thank God for those precious memories of people coming to Christ. However, in the surrounding forest, there were thousands of people living who had never heard the gospel. I shouldn't say never heard the gospel. Transport Radio and HCJB in Quito, Ecuador, were booming out the gospel night after night and day after day. And these people in the forest who had never seen a Bible, had never been to a meeting, were hearing the gospel over the radio. And so for a number of years, while we lived in that part of the Acre, we traveled on the river Tarawaka and the river Maru. We also traveled on the river uh, Peru, the river uh, Mukawing, and uh, so many of these rivers, preaching, taking the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've done this before, but what I would like to do is to give to you not only a missionary message, but a missionary experience and, and bring you with us in one of these uh, pioneer river journeys, preaching the gospel to men and women who have never heard the gospel before. When I say travel with us, our traveling is not over land, it's on these rivers. There are no roadways. These are dense jungles. The people who live in the jungle are people who cut the, the wild rubber trees to take off latex to make rubber. Uh, they, in the month of January and February, they gather in the Brazil nuts and send them to Cadbury's for you to enjoy the, the whole nut or whatever it may be that you, you eat. They, they gather in the Brazil nuts. And these people live scattered throughout the forest, most of them in little settlements at the side of the river. To reach these people, we will be going for maybe five or six weeks. We have a canoe. We call it a launch. It reaches from about here to the wall would be the length of our launch. The, the breadth of our launch is not quite twice the size of this lectern out to about here would be the, the breadth of our launch. And on board, why, generally I would travel with two Brazilians, Deodato and Sebastião were the two people I traveled with. Sometimes we, we, all of my family went. Audrey and our two children went and Dr. Geddes and Ethel and Lucy Marr came and the boatman. So I think that was eight of us on board the boat, a, a launch. Uh, we slept in the boat. We, we slept in the hammocks. We had a superstructure over the top of our canoe, and from the superstructure we'd hang, hang our hammocks. There's not room for eight hammocks, so we piled them one on top of the other and just prayed the person above you didn't have an accident in the middle of the night. And uh, I can tell you it did happen at times. But uh, uh, that would be our living accommodation for the next six weeks as we travel on those rivers. To travel on the river like that, of course, we needed all of our fuel. So we had a hundred gallons of petrol down at the back of the boat, all stored up in, in uh, five gallon drums, 20 drums of, of petrol for our motor. We not only needed fuel, we needed food. There are no shops on these rivers. You can uh, get monkey meat and alligator meat as we showed this morning or 
or the, the fish, plentiful fish on the rivers, and turtle we would have. But uh, we always brought two bags of rice and two bags of beans. At lunchtime, we had beans and rice, and at tea time, we had rice and beans. We never got them mixed up, but it was always that. Beans and rice at lunchtime, rice and beans at tea time, and a few cream crackers in the morning. And I can tell you, I was a lot thinner in those days than I am now. You would lose maybe up to two stone or two and a half stone if you're away for five weeks. And I can almost hear volunteers who would like to go just for that reason. On board the boat, we not only got all of our food, but we're taking literature, we're evangelizing. And so from every home crusade and scripture gift mission and the Trinitarian Bible Society, we were receiving booklets and leaflets and posters and New Testaments. And wherever we go, we would distribute the Word of God, as the Bible says, preparing for those for whom nothing has been prepared. Not only do we have our literature on board, we have a lot of medicines on board. As we travel on these rivers, you'll meet people with all sorts of diseases. You'll meet those who have got leprosy and leishmaniasis, others who have got infestation of worms. Remember one day, Dr. Geddes opened a girl who, a young child she was, who an obstruction of the bowel. And when he opened her, he found that she had a ball of 257 worms all wrapped up in their intestines, you get terrible infestation of worms. And I can tell you that after that operation, we didn't eat spaghetti for a long time afterwards, and, uh, but that's beside the point. On board, we've got our fuel, our food, our literature, our medicines to treat the sick. And also we make sure that we take a good sturdy chair because after the meeting, we'll be extracting teeth, not tonight, so don't worry about that. But after the meeting out there, why we will extract teeth or sometimes before the meetings. I remember in a place called Alagos in the river Tarawaka, we arrived in the morning and in the afternoon, I extracted 186 teeth while Dr. Geddes was up giving consultations to the sick. You can imagine what the meeting was like that night. It was a little bit gummy as the people who had got their teeth out came to the meeting and holding up handkerchiefs. Thankfully, they survived the night. But, but we do that because if you lived in the heart of the forest and you're too thick, there are no analgesics. They cut the bark of a tree and they make a tea and they'll try to take that to relieve the pain. But if the pain really gets bad, then they get someone to put a sort of wire into the fire until the wire is red hot. And then they take the wire out of the fire and, and put it into the tooth to burn out the nerve. It's painful at that time, but it will, it will cure it in the long term. And so when they hear there's a a gringo from Ireland who can extract teeth with a little bit of anesthetic, they will walk for days just to have their teeth taken out. And so we take our chair for the extraction of teeth after the meetings. Now that we've got everything on board, Audrey and the children come down to see us off. And we're going off, as I've said, for five, six weeks. There are no communications, no telephone. And so we commend ourselves to God's care and keeping, both our children at home with Audrey and, and ourselves as we travel on the rivers. We need God's blessing and God's protection because traveling on those rivers can be extremely dangerous. We try to hug to the side of the river. The river is flowing quite swiftly. The color of the wa water is the color of mud. And... Uh, You've got to keep to the side of the river because the main current is flowing at about 15 miles an hour, and that's very, very uh, quick for the current of a river. And so we try to keep to the edge of the river where the current is less. But we've got to be careful because as the river is eating into the clay banks, it's eroding, it's eroding rather the, the, the tall trees, the castanera, the Brazil nut tree. It stands about 70 feet up into the air. As it's eroded underneath, why, just a vibration of the boat going by is enough to cause a great tree to fall into the river and smash some of the canoes to smithereens. And so we pray for protection. We've got to pray for protection as we get across the river. Getting across those wide rivers that are flowing fast can be perilous. I remember one day traveling with Dr. Bill Woods and a boy called Martins on the river Mokoween. I was at the front of the boat steering this canoe, and Bill was down at the back, an old Lister motor that we had in the back of the canoe. And, and we were trying to get across, but we got caught in the, in the current being swept downstream. There was a massive tree in the middle of the, 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 the river, it was, and we were heading for the tree, and uh, it was impaled in the river, and we couldn't stop the canoe. And, and as I got near, I shouted, Bill, Bill, we're going to hit the tree. 
He shouts, jump overboard, jump overboard. Listen, in the river, we've got alligators, we've got piranha, we've got stingray fish. Uh, we've got a lot of things in there. And he tells me, well, I wasn't for jumping over. I waited for that moment of impact. And when we hit the tree, we hit it with force. I mean, I tried to put up my foot to stop it. But in doing so, I lost my shoe. And I said, Bill, I've lost my shoe. Listen, when, when that canoe hit the, the tree, why pots and pans and leaflets and books and boxes, they just flew everywhere. And I shouted, Bill, I've lost my shoe. He shouted back, I've lost my teeth. Uh, his teeth fell into the river. So this is not traveling on the river on a Sunday afternoon. For many of our missionaries today, Brazilians who are doing this in our place, they are hazarding their lives for the sake of the gospel. And why do they do it? Simply because that men and women may hear the glad tidings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We may travel for eight, ten hours as the sun is setting, and the brilliant forest that has been a verdant green during the day is now inky black as it's silhouetted against the, the setting sun. Out of the blackness of the forest, you can see an orange flame, yellow flame, indicating these are the houses we're wanting to get to. We pull our canoe into the side of the river, and I would climb up the muddy bank of the river while the two Brazilians make the beans and rice. And there right before us are strung all of these houses, all of them built up in stills because the river overflows its banks every, every year. Uh, most of the houses covered over with palm leaves. They've got bamboo floors, and some of them have got bamboo walls, but some of them have no walls, whatever, just a bamboo floor and a, and a covering over them. You always go to the biggest house. That's where the man who barters all of the rubber and the Brazil nuts, that's all brought to him, and then he sells it to a merchant. So you go to the big house. And when you get to the big house, there are no doors, to, there are no walls or no doors. So in Brazil, you just clap your hands and they'll say, Suba, that is, come up. And, and so you go up. When you go up, you don't say, we're the missionaries, we've come to evangelize. The Bible says, if you would win friends, you've got to show yourself friendly. And so it is, he brings us in and he pull out a bench and we'll sit and I'll ask him about his family. He says, well, we've only 12 children, or sometimes 15 children, which is not uncommon in the forest. I'll ask him how many dogs has he got? He says, I've got six dogs. That's important to him. Because when there are no shops, you've got to hunt. They go hunting every night and they need these dogs for hunting. They're hunting tapir and armadillo and all sorts of animals in the forest. They'll hunt for their, for their living. Uh, he'll ask me, how many bends of the river did you come today? Did you catch any fish? They love to catch fish. They talk about their fish. I, I, I'm in Kilkeel. I didn't know this. Uh, they tell me that the fish is the only creature that grows after it's dead. Did you know? A Brazilian told me that. When you catch it, it's that size. When you tell somebody about it, it's already got to be that size. And every time you tell it, it gets a little bigger. And that's how it is in Brazil. They love to tell their fish stories, only they talk about how thick their fish is. The Piraracu can weigh up to 300 pounds. It's a freshwater fish. They catch it in the lakes. And so they love to talk about fish and about hunting and dogs. And then finally, I'll say, would it be possible to hold a meeting here in your home? It may say on the wall, if there is a wall, God in St. Francis help us. In the corner is a little capella that has got the images of all the saints, St. Antonio, St. Peter, St. Francis, all the saints are there. Brazil is the largest Roman Catholic country in the world, but Brazilians are the most hospitable people in the world. And they just open their home. They say, the house is not mine, it's, it's our house, be at home. In 30 years traveling on those rivers, only twice have we ever been refused an entrance to a home. And so he says, the home is ours. And so I go back down to the river. We have a wash in the muddy river, a, a bath in the river. We have our beans and rice. And I tell them when they hear the music playing, then the meeting's going to start. We take the record player and we take our tilly lamps up to the house and hang them from the, the rafters of the house, the tilly lamps. We start the music. And as the music starts to play, why the people start gathering in from the houses around, as the music wafts out into the night. They don't come to church, or the house rather, the way you come to church. Granny comes with a pipe in her mouth and the children by her hand. She's using a pipe because the smoke keeps the mosquitoes away. And so she brings the children and they sit all over the bamboo floor, no fancy church or anything like that. And as they gather in, maybe 20, 30, 50, 100, 150 people, depending on the size of the place, it's time to start the meeting. But they've never been in a meeting before. They don't know what it is to sing a hymn. 
And so, when you say we're going to sing, you do the singing. Foina cruz, foina cruz, on jum dia eu vi, meu pecado castigado em Jesus. Foi ali pela fé que meus olhos abri, e agora me alegre em sua luz. I shall have the bells sing that with me. They'll sing another one. Eu tenho um amigo que me ama. That is, I have a friend who loves me. His name is Jesus. We're not only singing, but they're learning the gospel, and they're learning the simple truth that Jesus loves them. I remember a man who came to one of those meetings. I met, I met him five years later. He said, I've never been to a meeting, but I remember this. I have a friend who loves me. His name is Jesus. My friend, it is sowing the gospel. Now, it's different from Kilkeel because in this house, as the people are now singing, and they're sitting over the floor, and the lights are burning, those, those uh, tilly lamps attract all the flying insects of the day. Added to that, around the rafters of the house, there are boxes sitting, and in each box there's a hen. Now, I came from Donegal Road, Sandy Row, area of Belfast, and we never had hens in our houses. But the hens are sitting on those eggs, and they've got to sit 21 days before the chickens are hatched. So you can't put the chickens out of the meeting. We don't get many amens and hallelujahs, but clucks and clacks all around the room we can get. Uh, sometimes the houses, because it's built up in stilts, they'll put a sow underneath the house, and I'll tell you the smell can be high. We sometimes pray, Lord, make my nose deaf and dumb because the, the smell is great here. And, and so, in this sort of atmosphere, we've gathered. I say those, those lamps that are burning, thousands of insects. I'm speaking of thousands of them. And as they're flying, sometimes they get into your mouth while you're trying to speak. But more than that, murder wing, book a wing, Carabana, Matuka, uh, Kaba, they all fly and they all bite. And the meeting can be something like this. Porque Deus amou ao mundo de tal maneira que Deus seu filho unigênito para... And that's not just the preacher, that's the whole congregation. Everybody's moving because mosquitoes are biting. I remember being in a place one day called Capping Hung. Here's a mosquito and all was with me in this place. And it was about midday. The mosquitoes were so bad, they were like clouds of black smoke, swarms of them. I, I was at the front. I had water boots to my knees to protect my ankles. I had long sleeves to protect my arms. But everybody in the meeting, there were only about 30, 35 people in the meeting, everybody had hats on, not because they were in the meeting, but just to protect their heads. And the hats pulled down till their ears were bent over. Everybody had a large piece of cloth, like an old sugar bag. And as I was preaching at the front like this, they were swinging. Can you imagine 30 people swinging bags around all over the meeting and you're trying to conduct? It is different, different, different. My friend, the language is different. The climate is different. The circumstances are different. But there are two things that never change, and it are these. First of all, the need of the human heart. The man or woman without Christ, it doesn't matter what their background may be, what the climate may be, what the language may be, what the color of skin may be, my friend, those things do not matter. The heart without Christ is a lost heart. That lost heart needs to know about the love of Jesus, needs to know about salvation, needs to be warned about eternity, and so there is great need. The other thing that never changes is the everlasting message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And my friend, I'll tell you this, there's been no greater joy in my life than to be put into a situation of 150 people who have never heard the gospel before and never seen a Bible before, and for the first time tell them about Jesus and about salvation. And my question to you tonight is, how do you do that? That's where we want to finish off in this Week of mission. How do you preach the gospel to men and women who have never heard it before? I sometimes pray and say, Lord, help us make it clear and plain that Christ receiveth sinful men. Here are people who have never heard the gospel before, and I pray, God, that God will help us to preach it so that they understand it and to impact their hearts so that they will never forget it. This may be the first time but it may be the only time, the last time, they'll ever hear the gospel of Christ. How do you do it? 
Well, repeat it in our reading here this evening, in the prayers of the Apostle Paul, in the preaching of the Apostle Paul, in the pleading of the Apostle Paul. He prayed that they might be saved. He preached that they might be saved. He pleaded that men and women might be saved. And it's all wrapped up in that word, saved. Are you saved tonight? The word saved is at the heart of the gospel, and uh, sometimes you can leave them a big, long text. John chapter 3, verse 16 is a fantastic verse to use. I've used it many times on the river. Uh, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I've used that on the river. But many times I just use the word saved. The Bible says, fix it like a nail in a sure place. What does the word saved mean? Well, first of all, it speaks of the necessity of every man and woman. We all need to be saved. Why? Simply because we're all lost. The Bible reminds me, my friend, that as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death has passed upon all men, for all have sinned. You remember the Lord Jesus? He told the story of a lost sheep and of lost silver, and of a lost son. And as a matter of fact, he said that the Son of Man was come to seek and to save that which is lost, lost. My friend, if you're not a Christian this evening, can I say that that word lost sums up your life? You, you might feel that you're a winner in life, but I'll tell you this, before God and before eternity, my friend, you're lost without Jesus Christ. I remember traveling on the river Tarawaka, and people, we had stopped at a place called Nova Esperanza, about 30 people were in the meeting, and I think about six or seven of those people got saved. It was the first time they'd ever heard the gospel. They said, Pastor, will you stop on the way down the river and hold another meeting here? I said, listen, we've arranged to go to a little place called Sumare. It's three hours away from here, and I'm going to be stopping there. I told them the date that we hope to be there. They said, we'll be there. They were going to walk three hours just to get to a gospel meeting. It was about four weeks later when we got to Sumeray, coming back down river. And we got there about 5.30 at night. It was dark at 6 o'clock. It had been a rainy day like it is here in Kilkeel today. And therefore, there were no stars to be seen, no moon to be seen. It was a dark night. The lady of the house received us and made us rice and, I remember, eggs and, and uh, treated us so kindly. And, and I, there were only about 20 people in the place. And I'd said about having a meeting and we extract teeth the next morning. I said to the people from Nova Esperanza, not come, they said no. About half past seven, eight o'clock, we got around, we got the tilly lamps, and we were just about to start a meeting when we could hear boom, 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 coming in the distant forest. It was the people from Nova Esperanza. They had left at two o'clock in the afternoon to walk the three hours to Sumare, Nova Sumare. But a tropical downpour came down, and they got lost in the forest. And when you're lost in the forest at nighttime, there are no directions. They can't see the stars. They were absolutely lost. What do you do when you're lost? Why, they took their guns. They were calling for help, and therefore they were shooting in the middle of the night. Our friends took their guns and began to answer them. Boom, boom, boom. And the lost ones were found. Why? Because they recognized that they were lost, and they called for help. And my friend, can I say that if you're a person without Christ tonight, you're lost, I'll tell you this, you need to call upon the name of the Lord that you might be saved. You might be saved. If you could recognize that you're lost tonight, you would be a long way of trusting Christ. A lot of people don't believe that. They think that church is enough and ritual is enough and, and doing penance is enough. I heard about an Indian lost in the forest, and some rubber choppers met him, and they said, Are you lost? The Indian, a little bit proud, he said, Me no lost, wait while I'm lost. Huh? As, I, I'm not the lost. There are a lot of people like that. They don't recognize that they're lost. It's the necessity of salvation. We need to be saved. We're sinners. We're bound for eternity. And my friend, as the pastor prayed this evening, it is appointed on the man once to die, but after death comes the judgment to stand before God as a lost sinner. The necessity. The word saved speaks to me of the inadequacy. We all need to be saved, but we cannot save ourselves. The Bible says, can the leopard change his spots? 
Why, out there in Brazil, many of our friends are, are trying to do the best they can to save themselves. Where David and Christine lived at Camp Hidbondo, or near to where they lived, I remember meeting a group of pilgrims. Uh, they call them uh, Homeros. They were walking to a place called Joacero. I'm hoping to go to Joacero next year to do a conference. They were walking to Joacero. There's a padre there called Padre Cicero, a priest called Padre Cicero. And every year, why the people will go on a pilgrimage to go around the cathedral in Joacero, go on their knees. They were walking 250 kilometers, 250 kilometers. That, my friend, is about 150 miles walking to get to Joacero. When they would get to Joacero, they'd go around. I was giving these Homeros leaflets, speaking to them. And this man of 72, and I used to think that was old, incidentally, but this man of 72, he said to me, this is the 18th time I'm doing this. I said, sir, why are you doing it? I'm doing it to find forgiveness for my sin. I'm doing it that I might find grace to go to heaven. I said, sir, you don't need to go to Joacero. All you need to do is go to Jesus. And I shared with him the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why did they do it, my friend? Because they're conscious of their own inadequacy. My friend, I'll tell you this this evening. We need to be saved, but we cannot save ourselves. There's no church that you can join, no money that you can pay, no ceremony that you can do. There is nothing that we can do to save ourselves. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Saved, it speaks of the necessity of men and women. It speaks of the inadequacy of men and women. But thank God the word saved speaks to us of the possibility. It is possible to be saved. Did not the Lord Jesus say, the Son of Man has come to seek and to, he didn't say improve. To seek and to save, that was his loss. He did not come to judge the world. He did not come to blame. He did not only come to seek, it was to save that Jesus came. Therefore, to our congregation, as they sit in the simplicity of the forest, I tried to, to remind them, why, here we are. We are sinners. We cannot save ourselves. We're bound for eternity. My friend, is there any hope for us? Well, in ourselves, there's no hope. But God set forth His Son to be, says the Bible, the propitiation. That is, the one who would turn away the judgment of God. And what did Jesus do? The Bible tells us he took our sin on his own body on the tree. He was the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. And the holy, righteous God in heaven judged all of our sin on Jesus Christ when he died on the cross of Calvary. He bore our sin. He died our death that we might be forgiven. My friend, can I say tonight, it's possible to be saved. It's possible to know that your sins are forgiven. I had a priest came to see me one day, Padre... Uh, Umberto was his name. And he said to me, Victor, you evangelicals talk about being saved. Nobody can be saved until you get to heaven. I said, Umberto, he was German. I said, Umberto, listen, you speak German, I speak English. Look at what the Portuguese Bible says, Ephesians 2 and 8. For by grace you are saved. Not that you might be saved or you hope to be saved. My friend, thank God it's possible to know for certain that you're saved by the grace of God. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved, we need it. Saved, we cannot do it. Saved, Jesus did it all. Finally, I'll speak to these friends about the simplicity of being saved. It's so simple. Listen to what it says. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isn't that amazing? The Bible tells us of a woman who talked about having to go to Jerusalem. The Ethiopian eunuch had been to Jerusalem, and he couldn't find salvation in Jerusalem. My friend, thank God you don't have to travel far. You don't have to go anywhere or pay any price. The Bible simply says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And what does it say? If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. This is a promise from the God who cannot lie. This is a promise from the God whose word cannot be broken. 
I will tell you this, it's now coming 61 years since I trusted Christ as Savior and oh, that happy day. But you know something? I have nothing else to depend upon other than the work that Jesus did on Calvary and the word that he has spoken. That's what I'm leaning on. Jesus is all my hope and plea. My friend, can I say tonight, thank God, you can come to Christ. We have seen hundreds, if not thousands, of these people come to Christ on these rivers. Remember a little place called Chaparri I preached one Sunday morning. We hadn't intended to be there. Our canoe had gone to the bottom of the river. A, a, a submerged tree took the caliphate out of the side of the canoe, and it went down into four feet of water. We had to drag everything that we had soaked under the, the, the river bank and then work half the night to get the canoe uh, worthy for the river again. And we got to this little place, Chapery. There were only 12 people there. I remember speaking to them in the simple language that they would understand the message of the gospel. And at the end, I said, I'm going down to the canoe. If there's anyone here who wants to trust Christ the Savior, come down to the canoe. There were 12 of them there. Do you know how many came down to the canoe to get saved? All 12 of them. Do you know what I thought of? I thought of Northern Ireland. Preachers galore, Bibles galore, churches galore. But oh, how resistant people are. Oh, how resistant people are. Let me finish by telling you of Boko Duarte. A Saturday night in Boko Duarte, we were having an opener meeting. While the meeting was going on, I went round the crowd that was standing nearby on a hot tropical night, giving out leaflets, speaking to them about the gospel. This man I spoke to, he said, Sir, I, I so much want to get saved. I said, listen, come with me. The church was nearby. We'll find a little quiet place, and there you can call upon God. But he said, not tonight, tomorrow. I'll, I'll get saved tomorrow. I said, but don't wait. No, tomorrow morning I'll be at church. I'll be there. I'll get saved. When we tried to press on him, he said, look, I can't do it tonight. I've already heard a hall. I've bought the drink. People are coming for the dance, the festa, and I can't do it tonight. Tomorrow morning I'll be there. Reluctantly, we had to let him go. He went to his festa that night, and a fight ensued. He became involved in the fight, and he was taken by the police into a sort of ramshackle of a cell where he spent the night. And they were looking for another boy who was involved in the fight, a, a junior who tried to get into the dance and steal drink. His name was Zhuangji Deus. He lived on the other side of the River Acre, a place called Santa Maria. At first light of the Sunday morning, the policemen took our friend who wanted to get saved. I'll get saved tomorrow. They frog marched him up the street of Boca to Acre, down the river bank, into a canoe to go across to Santa Maria to arrest Zhuangji Deus. He was to identify who Zhuangji Deus was. When they got into the canoe and started to cross the river, the two brothers of this boy, Zhuangji Deus, were going hunting in the forest. When they saw the police coming, they shouted to their brother, Run! The police is com are coming! Zhuangji Deus didn't run. He went to the wall and he took down his rifle and at the window of that little shack at the side of the river, he took carefully aim, pulled the trigger, and one, whist one bullet whistled through the air into the temple of the man who said, tomorrow I'll get saved. Tomorrow I'll come to Christ. My friend, that bullet into the temple of his head not only killed him, but caused his body to fall into the water, splash into the water. We never found his body again. The only thing we found the next day was his shoe, with his foot still inside. Piranha had eaten the body. But we're still, he'd gone into eternity without God and without Christ. My friend, can I say tonight, this is the message that we've got to take across the world, but also across the street. And to your heart tonight, you need Christ. Let us pray. I want to thank you for your rapt attention this evening. We've taken a little time beyond our normal, but can I say this evening of a man or woman, boy or girl in the meeting tonight, and you're not a Christian, how important it is that you come to Christ. Without him, you're lost. To be lost in time would be terrible, but to be lost for all of eternity without God and without Christ, my friend, 
Can I say it's beyond our imagination? Would you not come tonight? Our Heavenly Father, we pray this evening that you will give the grace to our friends who are in this meeting and know not Christ, grace to do what they need to do that has come to thee. Grace to do that what they will be glad they've done in that day when they stand before thee. God, help them to come this night and call upon the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing just two verses of our hymn together this evening.